Uh, so today we'll be discussing relativistic tidal forces and curvature and the geodesic deviation uh, formula. That's the generalization of the Jacobi equation that we studied in classical differential uh, geometry to this scenario. <coughs> so uh, we've already realized that a way to detect uh, space-time curvature is to study uh, tidal forces. Okay, we've seen that the stresses of squeezing and stretching that we observe in tidal forces are, are the essence of uh, space-time uh, curvature. And so we want to uh, develop a formalism for it that's uh, 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 more attuned to Riemannian geometry. Okay, this will be useful also in applications, okay, because geodesic uh, deviation, the distance between or the vector between uh, two freely falling uh, test particles is controlled by the Riemann curvature tensor. And so we'll be writing down an equation which is geometric in character, isn't subject to all of the uh, coordinate uh, choices and uh, ambiguities that we come up against when we're discussing uh, the metric. It's easier to extract physics out of it. We're dealing directly with the Riemannian uh, 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 curvature tensor. And so uh, in some sense, it's clearer and cleaner uh, uh, theoretically. So we'll consider the motion of two nearby particles. Uh, they're in a curved space time, and they, they're, they're not subject to any uh, external forces. They both follow geodesics, but we want the four vector between them. We want to see that it responds to tidal forces. Now remember when we studied classical differential geometry, we studied the same thing there. We looked at, uh, at uh, uh, two points which are traveling on a geodesic on a sphere, for example, and we found that the uh, differential equation for the uh, vector or, uh, between them what, what was simple and it reflected the curvature of the sphere. Then we did the same thing in hyperbolic geometry, okay, and, and, and found the systematics there of the, same, of the same variety. We found that if the curvature was positive, that the, uh, that the two particles would um, separate from one another at a slower rate than they would in flat space. And in uh, space with negative curvature, they separate at a quicker rate. Okay, so we had a classification scheme and uh, a nice uh, visualization of, uh, of the effect, okay? It was clear that it was sensitive to the, to the curvature um, of, the, uh, of the space in the vicinity of the two particles. So I'll, I'll sketch the development here. There's some algebra to be done. Again, we'll leave that to supplementary lecture 11. You can follow along and, 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 uh, and, and see it there. And then you can check that. It's just a generalization of the exercise that we did in differential uh, geometry. So we begin with particle one. It's, um, it's, a, uh, it's a massive particle. I can parameterize its, its, um, its path with, uh, with proper time. Uh, okay, And I do the same with uh, particle two. Particle two is nearby, so, uh, so it's an x tilde. And in the equation, I have the, um, the Christoffel symbols along that curve, not this curve. So it, it's x tilde here. And then similarly, the uh, four uh, velocities are for the second particle. So I'm interested in the difference between the, uh, the two positions. I want to see how it evolves as a function of time. Okay, and, and also, once I know the difference in the positions, then I can calculate or set down differential equations to calculate the difference between uh, the, the, the rate of change of the, of the uh, distance between them in, 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 in such a fashion. Okay, and so I can relate the calculation also to u tilde. Uh, it's going to be related to u by the, the time derivative of epsilon. I'm going to expand things in powers of epsilon, where this is uh, this is going to be an equation, first order in epsilon. Epsilon will be much, much less than one in some, in some sense. And I'll get the first order equations of motion for epsilon. Okay, now uh, there are slicker ways of doing this. If I wanted, I think this is straightforward, okay? Now I could, I could look at uh, various gradients and look at the gradient of, of the tangent vector between the, between the two uh, 
uh, particles and uh, make a slicker uh, uh, derivation. Because here it's it's a little bit more work because I'm looking at a finite difference between two positions, not looking just for example at the, the uh, at the rate of change of 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 the position of the second one from the perspective of the first. A little less uh, arithmetic there, but I, I want to do this one um, because uh, it's particularly difficult. Okay. And this is the kind of thing that we'll be relating when we, when we, when we discuss the detection of gravitational waves. We'll have uh, two particles, okay, uh, which are free-falling. That is, in the, in the transverse space, there's no forces on them. They're hung, okay, but there's no transverse forces on them, and so they respond to gravitational waves. Okay, so, and we're looking at, this, at the vector between the two. That's a geodesic deviation, in, at least in that plane. Okay, now they respond to uh, a passing gravitational wave. We want to write down, and we want to write, write down that equation. So as soon as I get the the uh, geodesic deviation differential equation, then I can apply it directly to uh, the LIGO experiment, and uh, we'll, we do that in one of the appendices to the textbook. In the discussion here, I'll just look at the metric uh, directly, so you'll have a, a, a broader perspective on the problem. And you can you can see how it goes from both uh, from both perspectives, and I think that's good. Okay, the work that has to be done, of course, is that the uh, Christoffel symbols have to be have to be expanded. I have in in one of the equations I have the Christoffel symbols at x, and the other one I have the Christoffel symbols at x plus epsilon, and I'm going to ex uh, tell it expand that, and so epsilon is going to appear in the uh, in the expansion as well. So I've <coughs> Lots of uh, sources for epsilon dependence on the left-hand side, okay, explicitly. Then I have I have epsilon dependence in the four vectors. Then I have epsilon dependence in the space-time dependence of the Christoffel symbol. So I collect up a lot of terms, okay. I use the fact that my particles are traveling on geodesics. I collect up everything. It's clear I'm going to get gradients of. Christoffel symbols in certain combinations. It's clear that I'm going to get as well uh, uh, Christoffel symbols to the second order uh, squared, and I have to collect all that up. And it, it's not all that terribly difficult. It's clear on the right-hand side I'm going to first order an epsilon, so I'm going to have uh, two uh, velocity vectors and one epsilon vector left behind, and and then a lot of stuff. Well, the nice thing is that all the rest of the stuff is simply the Riemann curvature pencil. Okay, so take a look at the at the derivation in uh, in the supplementary lecture 11, or the derivation in the textbook, and you're all set to go. the The derivation is um, an exercise in indexology, as they say. In in the uh, differential uh, geometry uh, course, we do it in a more geometric way. Uh, and um, it, maybe that one is more, more instructive uh, to show the geometry behind it. But either way, there you go. Okay, so the Riemann geometry in the, in the Jacobi equation, okay, and we see a local space-time curvature determining the time evolution of epsilon, the geodesic deviation, just like we found it in our, in our models in, in classical differential geometry where, well, we were in fewer, fewer dimensions, but we had the second derivative with respect to a parameter along a curve being proportional to the Gaussian curvature, some kinematics, and then the uh, deviation itself. Well, one thing we might want to check is what we always do, it seems, in, in this course, is to take a look at this equation uh, in, a, in a weak gravity, non-relativistic scenario and see that it gives us familiar equations that uh, Newton would have written down in the first place. So let's, so let's do that. Okay, so this is rather imposing, but if, if I take weak gravity and non-relativistic motion, it'll simplify like mad. Okay, for example, non-relativistic motion, so, mu so my velocities are, 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 are basically just, uh, uh, <coughs> just uh, u0, just a component in the time direction, and then, my, and then my spatial components are much smaller than that, they're suppressed by a, by a power of v over c relative to that. And so if I'm just 
doing the non-relativistic limit. This is all that uh, this is all that I need. And you see that's great. That simplifies everything up here because the only component of u beta and, and u delta that I need are the zeroth components. So I have just I just need to bring on curvature tensor for two zeros downstairs. Okay. I'll look at I'll look at epsilon and I'm looking at its spatial components. So alpha will be i and i running from one, two, and three. And so that cleans it up and here you go. Okay, that, that's everything that's left. And epsilon, I'm just giving spatial uh, components to for the sake of illustration to compare to Mr. Newton. Well, Newton said, and we just go back to our discussion of tidal forces, that the, uh, that the distance between uh, the two particles subject to falling in a gravitational field is given to this second order differential equation, second order in time and second order in spatial derivatives like that. So somehow buried in here is a Newtonian expression for the Riemann curvature tensor, and let's dig it out. You see, there's epsilon here, epsilon down here. I've got to pull it out, do a little bit of indexology uh, to clean it up, and that's what I've done here. I've, I, I've pulled out I, I two uh, gradients hitting the hitting the uh, Newtonian potential. Okay, and I can and then I identify from the two from the two equations that uh, this is the identification of the components of the Riemann curvature tensor that contribute here. Two of the components are, are special, time-like, uh, uh, because of the non-relativistic uh, limit. Okay, and, and so, and so the, the equation then, uh, uh, th then re reduces down, reduces down to, uh, reduces down to this, okay, 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 and, uh, okay, so let's, let's, let's just take, take a look at that. Okay, so we have, so we have this this equation for the for the geodesic uh, deviation, I, and I'm cleaning it up. And my identification I made was that R upper I lower K was the appropriate combination of of, uh, of spatial gradients, pulling the epsilon out. Okay, and I get that. And now I want to. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. And so and so this is what this is what I have. Okay, now let's relate that to a to a, a Newtonian equation. If I if I take i e equals a k and, and sum over i and k, that's just a Laplacian on the right hand side. So just uh, uh, set k equal to i and then sum i one to three. You'll get del squared phi, as you see here. And on the other side, you get the contraction of the of the uh, Riemann curvature tensor in spatial components. Okay, that's the definition of the of the Ricci uh, 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 tensor for zero zero components. Ah, but that's of course dictated by uh, the uh, Einstein field equations, and so I write so I write them out. Okay, now if for the Einstein field equations for non-relativistic applications, t zero zero is just c squared times the times the mass density. T here is just the trace. The only component I get is just t zero zero plus rho c squared. Okay, and so the right hand side just becomes one half rho c squared. All this stuff. So I, I plug that in. I cancel off uh, factors factors of c and uh, and uh, look at my watch my factor of a pi here. And so I compare the left hand side all the way to the right hand side. And lo and behold, I just get the Poisson equation for Newton's. Uh, a gravitational field, and that's correct. Okay, right. so uh, so I get a familiar I get a familiar statement statement of, uh, of of Newton, and so I feel that uh, the, the equation is a, that for geodesic deviation is a uh, is a generalization to a relativity of Newtonian physics that that applies to a weak field and uh, non relativistic velocity. Okay, so that so that's good. We're in a, we can, uh, we've, we've, we've applied the Jacobi equation to situations in, in um, curved spaces in two dimensions, and so hopefully we feel re relatively comfortable with it, but always good to do more, uh, to, to do more examples. But our real object is to, is to study the discovery of gravitational waves and see how all of, uh, how, the gra how the discovery of gravitational waves uh, sheds insight into classical uh, general relativity. Note that remember, uh, so we're, we're going to find that 
that gravity that gravity waves exist. Okay, that, this justifies the the field theoretic notion of the Einstein field equations. Okay, and uh, we'll I'll find the properties and have a quantitative discussion of the strengths of the gravitational waves and their dependence on uh, on polarization and distance and source, what have you. Remember that in the case of Maxwell, it took about 25 years uh, for electromagnetic radiation to be discovered after Maxwell. Okay, remember it was done by Hertz, and it was uh, quite a tour de force of experimental physics in those days. the The difficulty was uh, to make uh, to make strong enough uh, sources of electromagnetic waves with uh, with a high enough um, uh, frequency uh, <coughs> to get uh, to get clear. Uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, propagation. Okay, okay. If, in fact, the equation. Remember that the, um, the history of, of this was that it was so difficult for Hertz to uh, to manage to generate uh, uh, radiation given the technology of the day that he thought it was just going. It was after the discovery that it, well, it, it was just a uh, a verification of some. Uh, Specialized uh, theoretical uh, idea and wouldn't have much of an impact. Okay, well, as we know, that nothing could be further from the truth. All of communication is being based on electromagnetic waves, but that's how it, that's how it was in, in, in the early days. And maybe something similar will happen here with gravity waves, because for gravity waves, it took a hundred years to find gravity waves, and you'll see that the LIGO experiment is rather a beast. Okay, it's not uh, it's not uh, your it's not an app on your iPhone. It's uh, it's a great big uh, beast of a, of a detector, and uh, it's very difficult to, to detect gravity waves because they're so so small. And um, hopefully there'll be technology coming along that will make gravity wave detection more useful than it is now. Now, of course, it is useful identified as useful already in the context of astrophysics. LIGO and similar detectors are now detecting gravitational waves from binary uh, stars and binary black holes at a regular clip, and uh, it's opened up a, a new uh, a, a new uh, specialty in astro astrophysics uh, experiment, and uh, it hopefully will lead to lots of discovery. It was discovered on September 14, 2015, okay, and. Uh, Hopefully you, you saw the, the webcast of the discovery uh, some months uh, thereafter, in which we found out that a binary pair of black holes were orbiting one another. Uh, they were losing energy to gravity waves, and they merged violently and radiated three solar masses in gravity waves. Okay, a huge amount of a huge amount of energy. Okay, the power that came off was 50 times the power of all the visible stars in the in, in the visible uh, universe. So it was quite a flash of energy. Okay, and it did so at frequencies between, okay, at the, at between 35 and 250 cycles per second. Okay, as, uh, as, as the binaries are, are uh, orbiting one another, okay, losing energy to gravity waves. Uh, okay, and starting and start to merge, they speed up and, and they tweak chirp, as, as people say, and, uh, and the LIGO experiment is, is tuned to, to capture waves in, in uh, a frequency range of uh, a couple hundred uh, or so hertz. And it was, uh, it was uh, indicated that it was a guess that, well, it approximated to be 1.3 billion li uh, light years away in the direction of the Magellan uh, area of the solar of the uh, of the galaxy, of the, of the uh, cosmos. Okay, uh, that's because there were two detectors. There was one in, in Louisiana, and then there was one in, uh, in in Washington State. And between the two of them, knowing the time delay between the detection of the gravity waves and, and such, they could approximate uh, the uh, the du the direction. Okay, and uh, and get a rough idea about it. Uh, now. Uh, with the with the uh, detection of spiraling uh, neutron stars, where the gravity waves are accompanied by electromagnetic waves as well, you can get uh, much better ideas of, of 
what you're looking at. Okay. You're, you, do, you make a detection, you tell all the telescopes in the world to look in a certain direction, there's, uh, there's emerging uh, neutron stars in such a direction, they find them, the, uh, the electromagnetic radiation from them lasts for a while, and they get, uh, they get a, a strong spectrum and strong signal with great detail. supplements the gravitational wave uh, detection. Oh, here I say it's, it came from the, the area of the Magellan Cloud in the southern celestial hemisphere. Okay. Power release was about 50 times more than the power of all observable stars. Okay, so the LIGO experiment, LIGO meaning, uh, meaning uh, uh, laser interferometry gravity observatory, okay, consists of, uh, consists of interferometers like Michelson interferometer with two arms at, at right angles. A laser sends, sends a beam, that's a beam splitter here. So part of the beam goes between detectors here and here, and part of the beam goes between detectors here and here. Then the, the beams come back, they merge, they interfere, and they're detected. Okay. Now the, <laughs> the detector is quite a wonder of uh, engineering. It's sensitive to just a tiny fraction of the radius of a proton, and it has to be. Okay, because the, uh, the, gra the gravity wave has a tiny, tiny effect on, uh, on, on space-time. Just a tiny, tiny uh, changes in physical distance between these two ends, which are a uh, 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 couple miles apart, actually. Okay, each beam travels about 100 times up and back, intense beams. You, you, you'll do that to increase the sensitivity by approximately Okay, and at, at the points A and B and C and D, you have four free floating test masses near us. Okay, isolated from the environment but able to move in the transverse direction without, without any uh, appreciable external forces. Very difficult to achieve. A great, you know, this, this experiment won a Nobel Prize for good reason. I think it should win the Nobel Prize just for engineering of this detector alone was quite, uh, quite a marvelous uh, achievement. Each arm is about two and a half miles uh, long. I'm trying to get my details right out. Okay. Okay. And so that's the idea of, uh, of, uh, of LIGO. And the next thing we want to, uh, we want to study is uh, gravitational uh, radiation and, uh, and see, what we're, uh, uh, see what we're up against, uh, see what uh, we expect from from merging uh, binaries and uh, make uh, uh, quantitative predictions for what should be seen at the LIGO detector. Oh, so we'll pick it up there next time.